Hi, my name is Bente, I'm the Norris Witch, and I have a very special guest with me today. In today's interview, we will be talking about German folk magic, or specifically Northern German folk magic. And we are talking today to Nick de Spökenkika. First of all, I really hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. I do speak a little bit of plot, but not that much. So I hope that it was not too awful. Um, as always, uh, of course, in the beginning, uh, I would like you to introduce yourself to my viewers. I bet a lot of them already know who you are. Some people already guessed that I would interview you uh, for this topic. So, yes, tell everyone, who are you, what do you do, and where can they find you? So, I'm the Spökenkika on most of my social media. You pronounced that perfectly, by the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am... 22 years old. I was born, raised, and currently live in northwestern Germany. I study both cultural and social anthropology as well as archaeology at university. And yeah, my entire content online basically focuses around northern or more, specific, more specifically northwestern German folk magic. And I branch out from time to time into some other topics relating to that, such as Germanic paganism, for example. Um, by the way, I also have um, some Silesian practices in my family that I also sometimes talk about, but the main focus is not Western German. <laughs> and yeah, you can find me on YouTube on here, on Instagram, um, Twitter, although I don't use that anymore, TikTok, although I don't use that anymore. Um, <laughs> now, I'm also, yeah, now I'm also on threads where I basically just shit post, so maybe don't follow me on there. And I'm also on Patreon where I uh, write more in depth blog articles and stuff about what I do. Basically, if you go to any of my social media, you'll find my link tree where all of my other social media is listed. And um, be aware of scammers which are out there because I now have also scammers. They've attacked me now too. Yay, the creator right of passage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you um, see like an account of mine that has like a weird spelling that you don't quite recognize and see that all of the videos on that account have been uploaded in like very short periods of each other. That's a scammer, honey. They are going to ask you for money and yeah, just block them. So that's that out of the way. What do you mean? You, you you don't contact your followers saying something like, Grand Rising, my dear, I sensed your energy and your ancestors asked me to do a reading for you, of course, for 50 bucks. Not, not just 50 bucks. I actually had a viewer of me on TikTok write me in my DMs and they were like, yeah, they asked me to do a reading for like a thousand euros and stuff. And I was like... <laughs> what kind of reading is that? Are they reading with diamonds? <laughs> I don't know how that works, but hey, if anyone out there wants to pay me a thousand euros for a reading, I, that I would be totally up for. I mean, that is insane. <laughs> yeah. I guess they have like a uh, an osteomancy kit with like diamonds and rubies yeah. and... <laughs> I mean, it would be kind of nice. Yeah. But yeah, that, that being down, yeah, scammers, incredibly annoying. I totally know what you mean. Um, but yeah, great. I'm very, very excited to do this interview, especially because, of course, I am also Northern German. Uh, so maybe maybe I will even be uh, able to um, participate a little bit and answer a little bit of the questions, uh, at least the ones that are not specifically about your practice, because uh, we have both questions that are more like general, more about the the practice in general and like definitions and things like that, um, that of course always arise <laughs> when you um, ask your viewers for questions because, oh yeah, by the way, these questions are not from me. These are all the questions that my viewers had for you, uh, as always. Uh, but of course, there were also some personal questions, so questions that focus more on your specific practice. Um, yeah, I guess let's hop into it. So, the first question was, I guess, the most basic question ever. Um, what would you say are some basic beliefs and basic practices in Northern German folk magic? Or like, at, at least in, in your practice, I know that there, of course, are different kinds of practices in Northern German, uh, in Northern Germany. So, uh, maybe you can focus on, on yours if that's easier. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's actually connected with my user handle. So, 
uh, some people might already be looking at the Spötenkicker and are like, that's kind of a weird name. I don't get that. And that's a low Saxon word. And basically, low Saxon is a minority language in northern Germany, southern Denmark, and the northeastern Netherlands. And that title already basically says everything about my practice, which is called Spötenkickerei. So a Spötenkicker is a practitioner of Spötenkickerei. And that practice basically entails... Um, soothsaying and is very divination oriented. So um, Spötenkika translated into English would mean something like like um, watcher of paranormal events. Literally translated it would be spook watcher but watcher of paranormal events basically gets the idea across better. That makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are also like uh, regional variations in how it is said like um, I say Spötenkika and I think people from like um, Schleswig-Holstein say something like Speutenkika, although I'm not sure if that's the right region where they say that. <laughs> and so basically this practice exists from what I've heard, from what I could gather in all of northern Germany in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I guess in comparison to other forms of folk magic from surrounding regions, this is like a thing that kind of sticks out that this Folk magic is very divination oriented. And I've already made a YouTube video entirely on that. I don't know if I should recommend people to watch it because it's quite old and I'm not so proud of that anymore. I just rewatched <laughs> it before this interview and I'm like, mm -hmm. I could have edited stuff a bit better and made it a bit more interesting. Um, anyway, um, the information is, is there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and basically what this entails is not just um, divination through something like um, tarot cards, for example. Um, we have a different term for that, and that's Wicken. So if you use like tools for divination, like cards, you are doing Wicken and you become a Wicca or a Wicca Vief. This is like a practitioner of oh. divination specifically with cards or any tool, basically. But a Spötenkicker specifically is a person that has more of a vision approach to divination, meaning that um, in folklore, they often get random visions that they cannot control, that just pop up one day and they foretell a specific thing, usually some kind of calamity like a wildfire, a war, a disease, death, such things. And um, other times people are willingly seeking out these forms of divinations through some practices, um, mainly practices that center around auspicious days like the winter solstice and take place around graveyards specifically. Um, so my practice kind of focuses on that, on that divinatory aspect. So I incorporate both Spötenkickerei and Wicken into that. And generally in like more modern times, anything remotely magical has all of been kind of combined into the term of Spötenkickerei. So Nowadays, it doesn't really matter what exactly you do in your magical practice. Everything would be classified as Spötenkickerei. So even <laughs> people who aren't from northern Germany and practice some kind of magic, people here would say that these people are Spötenkicker. So it's kind of become an umbrella term like which nowadays? Yeah, basically. Hmm. Um, and this is like the um, aspect of North German folk magic that has a name to it and a more or less specific um, description but there are also practices that don't really have a name and i would say that's actually the majority of them um, practices that are just like um, not thought of as specifically magical and are kind of overlooked a lot of the times and they often center around more um, christian things i would say like for example working with saints and i feel like that's also a partly the reason for why they aren't um, viewed in a specific magical light because they have this more Christian guise above them. And these are like things generally, um, as I said, saint work, but also working with folkloric characters of a specific area. These things are like the um, unspecified things that don't have specific terminology exactly in Northern Germany, but are still very much part of North German folk magic. That was kind of a long answer, but I hope this explains it. I think it was a great answer, though. I already learned something new, which is awesome, especially since I'm learning something about 
where I'm from. So, so that's great. <laughs> um, so one, one question that arose, which probably arises often when you talk about folk magic was whether you would say that Northern German folk magic, would you say it's more Christian or more pagan or neither? Mm, that's kind of a tough one because, um, as I said, there are things which are more Christian leaning, such as saint work, but even then, they often do things in a very, like, not Christian way. Like, if the Pope saw it, he would probably fall over dead. And the, th the thing also is that in my area specifically is, I think, the only area in Northern Germany that's actually Catholic. Uh, mm. The rest of Northern Germany is very Protestant-focused. So yeah. maybe because of that, Saint work is also bigger in my area in particular than it would be, for example, where you come from. Mm. Um, but as I said, even then, even when we do things in a more Christian way, they are not exactly 100% certified Christian. Like, um, I was on a podcast last year, I think, with uh, Ella Harrison, where mm -hmm. I talked about how St. Anne is venerated in my village. And she is a biblical figure. She's a saint from the Catholic Church, but she has folklore in my area that um, connects her to my area specifically and also to folk practices and through that this Christian figure becomes sort of embedded in a folkloric mishmash of different ideas that isn't necessarily 100% Christian anymore for example we um, ask her to um, like if a woman wants to get pregnant she would go with the end procession that takes place in August and goes over the fields to bless them and she would sing a specific low Saxon song that would call on Saint Anne to um, make her like um, have better luck at getting a husband or at getting children. And I don't know if the Pope would necessarily approve of that. Um, <laughs> and then on the other side, we have the things which are less Christian, but I wouldn't necessarily say like um, pagan. Um, because when I say pagan, the belief, I think, is when people hear that is that they assume that it is automatically pre-Christian. And yeah. uh, in that way, dating back over a thousand of years and hasn't really changed. That's not necessarily what I mean. Uh, it, for example, Spötenkiekerei is one of these things. It lacks a lot of Christian elements. But I wouldn't necessarily say that that makes it automatically, automatically pre-Christian pagan. It just makes it different, I guess. Read, yeah. Not to say that there are no pagan associations with that. I think there absolutely are. But to think of it as like a quote-unquote pure reflection of pre-Christian pagan reality here is, I think, not very accurate. And generally, mm -hmm. paganism and Christianity in our part of Europe generally interweaves and intersects in a lot of interesting ways. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I kind of feel like a lot of these practices are just, they're not linked to any religion. Like you, you could, you could, or you could see them arise or similar practices arise in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different religions. I mean, especially things like uh, having visions or maybe like having visions in your dreams or doing some kind of divination. I mean, that exists literally everywhere. Um, so yeah, I think it totally makes sense that it doesn't really tie to any specific religion or any specific time. Um, what I personally also think is very interesting, which I don't know a lot about other areas, folk magic or folk practices or even folklore. Um, I have only started last year or like around a year ago to kind of dig into the folklore from the area where I'm from. Which I personally found very interesting is that I could see a lot of stories that were either Christian and then put more into a pagan context, or they were originally actually pre-Christian Scandinavian, but were put more into a Christian context. So, for example, there's the story about how the hidden the hidden folk came to be, so like elves and spirits like that. Um, which originally had nothing to do with Christianity, but like just a couple of characters were exchanged for Christian ones. 
um, to kind of put it into a more Christian context. Um, I think that was very, very interesting. So like the the practice or the, the story is basically still the same, just the context has changed because the culture changed. That's the thing with um, which I find especially interesting um, with the era that you're from, like uh, the border region with Denmark, that there is this intersection with um, Scandinavian folk magic and more strongly than in my era because we are closer to the Netherlands, for example. Yeah. So our stuff is still a bit different and less um, like obviously North Germanic. It's very, um, it's different basically. It doesn't have um, these connections with characters that you would immediately like somewhat recognize from the, the other or something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think that's in general so interesting because I mean, like the, the town where I'm from and the area where you're from, they're not that far from each other. So it's like you have like a, a very a very different kind of folk practice and folklore, even though the places are not that far from each other. I think that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily expect. I would guess that someone who's from the US, for example, would look oh, at yeah. would look at how, how far away our areas are. They would say like that's nothing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think that's also a big, uh, and I know this question will come up later in the outline, but I'm already going to mention it here. That's a big misconception. I feel like with um, forms of German folk magic that, especially people who aren't from Germany or are outside of Europe, see these areas and think, oh, they are basically like next to each other. So their cultures must be very similar, which is not really the case. No. And um, for anyone listening and wondering where I'm mainly from and where I draw my full practice from. It's basically the area um, around the Emsland, Tecklenburger Land, Münsterland and Osnabrücker Land. So if I will put any, a map. <laughs> yeah. So if any people are watching, this is basically my area of expertise, so to say. And I personally would say that we are um, like our areas are closer but not exactly neighbors but yeah, no. someone from the us might look at that and be like oh that's just a, a stone throw i could drive that in one day so neighbors basically yeah and, and the thing is that even with the like town over practices are going to be different mm. and a lot of people might not necessarily realize that and even when it comes to language and culture things are going to be drastically different. Just the low Saxon dialect here has many different varieties that differ from village to village. While you can still somewhat understand each other, but the differences are very noticeable still. And if you go up a bit north um, from where I live, like straight north, you'll enter an area known as the Saterland. And they, there, they, there, they speak uh, the uh, Sata Frisian language which is like the smallest language in Germany, basically. Oh. And they have like a very unique culture and stuff and their own mm. language, um, which is very separate from the surrounding areas. And this is something that someone from outside wouldn't necessarily like get because the Saterland is like only three villages big. But even there, there are still differences. And I feel like if you are looking into German folk magic, North German folk magic, or just European forms of folk magic in general, you'll have to get rid of this idea that supposed geographical proximity automatically equals similar practices. Yeah, especially especially since, of course, what you see now as Germany has not been there. Like the borders themselves have not been there for a long time. I mean, the area where I'm from has been Danish up until like 150 years ago. So uh, even even only that, of course, that will have a, an immense influence. Um, and like, <laughs> it's so funny talking about like different, different German dialects. That's just insane. Yeah. I mean, specifically my town has this very specific dialect, which is Petu Tantenschnack or just Petu. I don't know if you have heard about that. <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> It's it's so cool because it's it's so fucking fringe. I mean, if you want to get into the fringiest fringe, that's like that's that because it developed basically because um, there were boats, of course, going in the Flensburger Förde, so in the 
water area where I'm from, uh, mm -hmm. between Denmark and Germany. And there were these these elderly women sitting on these boats, um, having tea and eating cake and and talking basically. And because some of them were Danish and some of them were German, and some of them, of course, talked into in in like very basically only plot and other people were talking more like high German. Um, all of that mingled together and formed another dialect, which is Petutanschnack. And a lot of people in in uh, in Flensburg still speak like that. And if you even just go down where I'm living now, which is only like 150 kilometers south, I think, um, people in Hamburg don't know those words that we use. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's just, that's insane. Yeah, I think, um, for example, you guys up um, in Hamburg and uh, Schleswig-Holstein, I think the your name for village is like Derp, and our name here is Dorp. So these are oh. a few differences, and our word for to talk is Kön, and your word for to talk, I think, is like Schnacken or Schnacken. Or yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we also we also have Klön, but I think that's more of a Hamburg thing than a Schleswig-Holstein thing. I don't know though. But Klönschnack no. is well. We we combine it. We say we we we're doing Klönschnack. We're like taking a break and talking. Um, oh no, I um, I I don't mean Klön. I mean uh, our word is Kühn, so without an L. So oh. K U E R E N. <laughs> okay, yeah, that is that is very different. <laughs> yeah, and we're basically I think the only area that says Kühn, like uh, north of us, they say rotten and then you guys come with schnacken and stuff what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's very oh. interesting talking to little saxon speakers from different areas and yeah it's also funny to like um talk like at the secret language that the people from central and southern germany don't understand yes <laughs> but then they come with their like Bavarian or something and then I have no clue what they're talking about. Yeah, same. I'm I'm lost. If I would go to a to a village in Bavaria and people would actually talk Bavarian there, the dialect, then I would be completely lost. <laughs> yeah. Ah, but well, I, I already kind of uh kind of went into the next question. Or we also also hello, my cat just joined me. You can't see it because it's blurred. Um <laughs> Uh, so, we already talked a little bit about that, like the culture and the languages, and with that, of course, also the folk practices will change and, yeah, be a lot different actually in different areas of uh, of Germany. And I guess if you're in social media, most people will hear about Southern German folk practices, especially because I don't I don't know a lot of people are like obsessed with Krampus. I don't know I don't know why, but it's a thing. Um, so. One question that arose was, how does it differ? So how does Northern German folk magic and folk practices, how does that differ from Southern German ones? Mm, I think, um, actually, there is a um, collab coming out somewhere in 2024, early 2024, with a certain someone about this very topic. <laughs> so depending on when this video goes up, that video might already be up. Um, oh. But uh, just to um, give you guys an idea of the differences, um, I feel like from my perspective, uh, Central and Southern German folk magic centers more around like a unified um, female deity, like for example, Frau Holle in Central Germany or Frau Perchter in Southern Germany and also the German-speaking Al uh, Alpine regions. In Northern Germany, that's not really a thing in that way. Um, I've heard some accounts of um, folklore from Northeastern Germany, where there is kind of such a figure, which is called Frau Gode. Mm. And the thing with that is that it's probably a misinterpretation of uh, Wodan, because uh, there is this um, old high German term, I believe, that go that's like Frau or Fru or something. No, mm. it's, I think it is. And that yeah. usually um, meant Lord back then. And so it was uh, Fru Godan, uh, Fru Godan, something like that. And it basically mean, meant Lord Vodan. But over time, 
that term kind of fell out of use and so people thought it was similar to the those saxon term fru or the high german term frau which of course means lady so this got turned into lady vodan then and <laughs> so we have this interesting gender switch that happened in northeastern germany where this vodan like figure got turned into a female figure that on surface level has similar associations with Frau Holle, like leading the wild hunt, for example. Mm. But other than this exception, which likely um, is based on a misinterpretation, we don't really have this strong female deity-like figure in Northern Germany. We do have uh, groups of female spirits, um, which are kind of also connected to that complex, but um, are like more numerous in their accounts and folklore um, and we have instead of Frau Holle or Frau Perchter we have um, this figure which is often referred to as uh, der wilde Jäger or der wilde Reiter which is like the wild hunter or the wild rider and this is like likely some sort of later folkloric interpretation of possibly Wodan which is like for anyone that doesn't know, Wodan is the continental West Germanic equivalent to the Norse god Odin. So I would say that Northern Germany has more focus on like a male deity-like figure and folklore when compared to Southern Germany. And besides that, I don't know why exactly that is, but we don't have like things such as Krampuslauf here, which I think is quite a shame. Mm. Like the most metal winter spirit that we have up here is like I think Knecht Ubrecht, which I don't know if you guys have that up in Schleswig Holstein, mm -hmm. but um it's it's nice, but it's not Krampus. Like let's not kid ourselves. Yeah. Um we might or quite possibly had something like that in the past, but it's just not around anymore. And yeah, that all of that and in addition the language is just different in these two areas. So the terminology for our magic will be different. These are like the biggest, I think, differences between North and South when it comes to folk magic. I always wonder whether, I mean, m maybe that's a reach, uh, but I always wonder if that's because, like, if we look at, if we look at Northern Germany, like the most Northern part of Germany, of course, there was a lot of influence from pre-Christian Scandinavians. So, like, of course, Northern Germanic peoples. And then in central Germany, we have like the more continental Germanic peoples. And then in the, in the like right in the south, we have more of a Celtic influence. Mm. Um, I always wonder whether that has something to do with that. But of course, it yeah. could be a reach because it is a very long time that's between. Yeah, <laughs> I've asked myself that question a lot. And if anyone is like um, interested in anything Germanic paganism or something, study migration patterns because this stuff will kind of give you some ideas it's because, so interesting and so complicated <laughs> yeah exactly i mean we talk about this stuff in my classes in archaeology that i take at university and we um went over how the um first of all how the indo-europeans came into europe and what cultures were there before and how they influenced each other and how things such as the germanic tribes and the celts even came to be and stuff and how they all moved and basically you get to a point where well, I feel like every single area in Europe at one point or another has either been Germanic, Slavic, Celtic, or Roman, or yeah. most often all of the above. So you have these different layers of culture all absorbing into each other, sort of. So practices from one culture get adopted by another, and it's basically all just a giant melting pot. Mm, but I love that. Yeah. I think it, it is so complicated, but it's... It's so interesting, and I'm I'm highly jealous about you learning about that in university. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really hard, but also really rewarding at times. One question that arose was, I think that was a very interesting question because I've never been asked those questions before, um, and maybe that will be a funny question for you specifically. But um, do you know if there are still Northern German folk practitioners? that actually like grew up with the practice or is it something that's more being reconstructed now like was was it dead <laughs> and people are trying to revive it 
or is it a, a thing that's still very much living? Mm, I think that's that's the big difference between things like Germanic paganism and folk magic, because with paganism there's very much this like cut off point. Um, with folk magic is the thing that kind of comes after a bit, where things intermesh more with Christianity, and folk magic and folk culture generally is a thing that is alive and ever-changing. Uh, and so, yes, folk magic, or hereditary folk magic, as this question, I think, asks, is still a thing in Northern Germany. I don't know any of them personally, I think, uh, but I do have, like, on my YouTube, sometimes I get comments by people who are like, oh, I'm Spökenkika von Schleswig-Holstein and stuff. <gasps> That's and, so cool! <laughs> and... Um, I do know that in my village there um, is this family that uh, in the past they made these like salves out of herbs and they gathered the recipe so you just knew some ingredients and people would come to them and they would get the salve uh, for their warts that they had on their body and then this family additionally or uh, the uh, man of the household would then whisper a spell onto the warts to make them go away. The classic, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if they do this spell anymore, but still to this day, the um, doctors that we have in our village will tell people to go to that family, to go to that household to get that self. So that's in so that cool. way, this is kind of a hereditary thing that stems from folk magic and folk culture. That's so cool. And um, besides that, I think one of the main differences between this my generation of folk magic practitioners to those previously is that I specifically name what I do magic and folk magic and I very consciously use this terminology and talk about it in a witchy way whereas before people wouldn't really pay any mind to that and they would just say like oh this is the things that we do this is just part of our culture and stuff so I think in that way this is how we differ but other than that, different forms of folk magic exist basically, I feel like, almost everywhere. Mm. Even if it's just a small thing like my family typically heals wards or my family typically does this and that. There's a funny account of a man from a city near me that did like urine divination where people would bring their pee in jars and that man would look at it and be like, you have cancer. <laughs> 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 stuff like that that's a dramatic example <laughs> <laughs> but literally i have the folklore book right in that bookshelf in there it, it's literally written like that oh wow so he would, uh, apparently he would diagnose stuff like cancer and then apparently he would also have some herbs to cure that i don't know how that worked out hmm. um, but this is like stuff that we have accounts for so hmm. even if it's again just a small thing hereditary folk magic is still very much alive mm -hmm. i will i will i will slip a question in here because i think i think it's so important what you said that it's previously it was just more things you do which like as someone who is currently trying to get into folk magic and the folk magic of their area and stuff i'm seeing more and more things that i have been doing which i even even as someone who got into wicca or in more broader witchcraft did realize was something magical uh like for example uh we used to do um like lead pouring or wax pouring on new years of course which of course is divination like that was the purpose of it but i never saw it as that and that is something that as a child i still did or like for example very simple things i guess that's something that is done in a lot of different areas where like if you are talking about something positive that has happened to you you would knock three times on wood like things like that that are so simple but you just don't realize it that you grew up with actually something magical um are there things that you grew up with personally um i think i grew up with um like the folklore of my area of course because these are the things that my grandparents used to tell me um again if um, you will listen to that podcast with Ella Harris, the folklore that I talk about is stuff that my grandparents told me. And of course, there's so much more. And these are mainly the aspects that I grew up with. Um, I 
also like i don't know if this is necessarily a german food magic thing or just a my family thing but my grandfather used to be like oh yeah um try to um wrap that tree in your hands and feel its energy just go for it and i was like as a child of course i'm going to do it so i stood in the garden for like half an hour with my hands wrapped around the tree there and be like and i feel anything um, <laughs> Again, this might just be a, my family thing. I can't imagine like people a hundred years ago being like, try to feel the magic of the tree. So it's probably a new age thing that my grandfather randomly picked up one day. Mm. Um, but yeah, these are these tiny magical knickknacks that I grew up with. And I also um, heard some like, uh, other than folk stories, also magical encounters that my family had from different members of my family. Mm -hmm. which are which range from funny to downright like bone chillingly scary such as people foretelling the end of the world and stuff with their like visions <laughs> so yeah that's what i sur was surrounded by growing up mm. by the way it's like you had a really cool grandpa <laughs> yeah I, I, he's still alive though i still have oh, a very cool grandpa okay I'm I'm sorry. I, I hope I didn't jinx anything. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's all. Okay, we already got a little bit into the topic of like spirits and the spirits that uh, exist in Northern German folklore and stuff. Uh, what would you say are like the most important ones? Mm. Yeah, as I said, Der Wilde Jäger, of course. Um, he has a lot of folklore, especially around this time of year when we are recording this during the Raunechte. Mm. Um, there is folklore, actually kind of funny folklore, of um, him riding around the sky with this like spurred entourage and usually there are also a lot of dogs that uh, come with him and then like bark and that's like the warning sign that you need to get away right now. Um, he also is like, instead of Frau Holle, he is the reinforcer of the taboos around this time. So if you spin, he will come for you and there's a story of like, a man like I think weaving and then the Wilde Jagd uh, goes above his home and he makes jokes about them and then um, a giant like horse foot crashes through the window and smashes um, down the man and then a giant booming voice from the sky is like if you make fun of me you will have to join me in my hunt and then that man disappeared and had to go hunting with uh, Wodan basically for the duration of the Raunechte and yeah this is like the main guy here up um, mm, I so love that story so much it's it's so in general stories about the wild hunt and like people just also like pe people who behave like they should just getting like like a deer leg or something from the wild hunt it's like <laughs> what that's so random but okay yeah, but also I feel like very much in the vein of Wodan like he is kind of a he's the guy to randomly give you something like that um other than that um i feel like water spirits are very big here of course uh, northern germany is like right next to the coast um but even though my region is not necessarily near the coast like i still would have to drive like up to an hour to get to the nearest beach um we do still have water spirits this far inland because um, I don't know if people generally who aren't from Germany know this, but this is an area that is very flat. So we're um, low lying and uh, barely above sea level. So the, I don't know if this is the right English word, but the ground water. Um, <laughs> I don't like, know. <laughs> it's like very close to the surface. So this um, we have a lot of um, ponds and bogs and moors and stuff. Again, with um, the rain that's constantly coming in from the North Sea, like it is today. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's this bad in Hamburg, but we it have is. a lot of like storms here and hail and suddenly everything was white outside because of it. Um, so this area is very watery uh, because our geography basically makes us that way. And especially my region, this meant that traveling from village to village was oftentimes historically a very treacherous and dangerous thing to do because if you weren't careful, you would basically drown. Even if you are miles away from the nearest point in the coast, the ground could just randomly swallow you up. That's There's, true. 
actually a um, famous poem which comes from somewhere or, or near my area, which I think it's called Der Knabe im Moor or something like that. It's I from a. I, I think I know that one. Yeah, it goes like schaurig ist sie was more to gehen. Yes. It's like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this is like a famous poem from my era specifically that is uh, basically detailing the history of this era with moors and box and stuff. And even in my era, we have um, very unsteady ground so that sometimes even entire houses can fall into the ground randomly and disappear. And miles later randomly pop up in a stream like all ripped apart that is so scary <laughs> yeah uh, it hasn't happened in like a hundred years or something but it's still a scary thought and like even mm -hmm. 70 years ago two girls dried in the forest in my village because that regularly floods so all of this being said this has had a very big impact on the psyche of the people who live here so this treacherous nature of our ground and our weather has been personified in a lot of spirits so when you engage with north german spirits you'll find a lot of um beings that will try to trick you that seem good at first and then turn around to like basically murder you mm -hmm. um, and you'll find a lot of folklore detailing like ghosts of people that got lost in the bog somewhere and now haunt that area so if you engage with the spirit world in this area you will see a lot of tricksters ghosts lost spirits and the wilde jäger of course so you really have to get your mind into the mentality of what is my landscape like? How does that affect the folklore here? That's so interesting. I don't. I actually don't know if that is that much the case where I'm from. I would have to look into that because at least I don't know of a lot of like bog spirits and mm. things like that. That's very interesting. I, I will. I will make sure to do some t some research on that after <laughs> after the interview. You were giving yeah, I... me some good ideas. <laughs> You're welcome. I think that. Um... Of course, Flensburg is like very close to the coast. So if you don't have bog spirits, you probably ha will have some kind of sea spirits that is like representative of a flood or something. Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't know of one specific one exactly in Flensburg, but I, I guess there must be a lot. Th there just must be. I mean, we are right at the uh, at the Baltic Sea. So like, yeah, it, ju it just has to be that way. Um, OK, a little bit of a different question, but I think that one was very fun. What would you say is the biggest misconception about Northern German folk magic? And I mean, if if maybe a misconception about Northern German is a little bit too specific, then maybe just about German would yeah. also be fine, I guess. Yeah, I think um, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of like viewing Germany or European countries as one homogenous blob. Mm. And uh, again, there's so much cultural diversity even just within northern germany like for example you have like danish history in your area i am more uh, connected to the netherlands northeastern germany used to be slavic for a long time until it got resettled by um germans that kind of intermingled with the slavs in that area so their folk practice will also be more slavic as is their dialect that also has some Slavic features, especially um, in stuff like names or place names. Oh, place names is a huge one, yeah. Yeah, so basically, if you look at a map of Germany, anything ending in it's, wits, wits, or off is a Slavic city, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's one big misconception. And other than that, I would say that um, people will see the proximity that northern germany has to scandinavia and they mostly will already know stuff about scandinavia so they just assume that northern germany is the same because scandinavia is their reference point yeah. and of course this is true for some areas like yours that is more scandinavian influenced but that's not true across the board and i feel like you even though the sources are way less accessible 
um, you kind of do have to look for them and look for the culture that is in northern Germany to get a better feel of it and not just generally make big sweeping assumptions like that. Yeah. And yeah, that's true. It It is hard. <laughs> I feel like try, trying to get into any kind of folk magic if you don't speak the language mm, yeah. will be very hard. I have the same problem with Scandinavian folk magic. That's why I'm learning Danish now. <laughs> It's a it's a fun time. All right, in another pretty a pretty niche question. Do you know like is there a German equivalent to tarot? The person that asked the question specified and said like kind of like Kipperkarten are like Le Normal. Um, yeah, that's the question that I was a bit confused about because both the Kipperkarten and the Le Normand cards originate in Germany. Uh, specifically in Bavaria, even though Le Normand is like a very French name that was basically just a marketing scheme. I was I about to say, isn't that French? <laughs> yeah. um, there was this um, Parisian um, the the diviner, yeah, the yeah. series, um, Marie Le Normand. And um, the cards were basically just named after her to yeah. get them more publicity. Uh, and in fact, Marie basically really never used these cards because they existed after she died. Um, nice. <laughs> uh, there are some cards which of course predate that, but again, it's very difficult to say if Marie ever was in contact with them. Uh, mm. Again, I have a video describing all of this on my channel. Um, shame, shameless self-plug in here, by the way. Do that but and I will link everything in the video description. <laughs> Okay, so if any of you are curious about the hi German history of the, the Normand cards, um, the link will be down below. I will uh, definitely go watch that. <laughs> the thing is that, um, also this is an older video, so it might be a bit awkward anyway. Um, the thing is that these cards originate in southern Germany, specifically in Bavaria. I feel either Nuremberg or Munich. I'm not 100% sure on that anymore. Um, but southern Germany. So in northern Germany, not to my knowledge, uh, don't have these cards uh, or cards that are made in Northern Germany like that. Historically, Southern Germany was more of like a printing capital or like better equipped financially for printing. Mm. Um, so we don't really have anything specifically to Northern Germany, but yeah, Kipperkarten and Lenormand are German. So you can just go for it. There's even like a, I have it right here actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. use Kipperkarten, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's even a uh, book, a German book called uh, Spiel der Hoffnung, Ursprung und Entwicklung der Lenormand Karten by Alexander Glück that details the entire history very in depth. It is in German though, so for any English speakers, I'm sorry, you'll probably just have to watch my video on it. Oh uh, no, what a shame! <laughs> but uh, yeah, other than that, this is. I guess my answer. We have mm. Southern German folk, uh, divinatory cards, not necessarily Northern German folk uh, divinatory cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say? Would you say uh, either one of them is kind of like tarot? Because I feel like Lunormand is definitely not like tarot. I feel like it's just used very differently, and I feel like the approach is much more intuitive than with tarot. Um, but I have never used Kipperkarten, so uh, Kipperkarten, it's. It's interesting because they are basically a card deck that was invented for divination. So usually with tarot and stuff, divination came after and originally it was a game. Um, Kipper Karten are uh, specifically designed to give you divinatory messages and you can't really use them for anything else. Um, so in that way, they aren't similar to tarot. They also don't come in suits like tarot or Lenormand. Hmm. And yeah, I think they are like basically more similar to an Oracle card deck, I feel like. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so like the, the short answer is no. <laughs> we, we do not have an equivalent to a tarot. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, as you probably know as a fellow creator, um, there are always a lot of people from, for example, the US and Canada or like Australia or somewhere um, that originally come from, for example, Northern Germany, which I feel like it's very cool if people can track that down so 
so like specifically that they didn't just come from Germany, but from Northern Germany or like one specific town or something. Um, are there specific practices that those people could uh, incorporate into their practice, even though they don't live there? Because of course, like if you want to practice some some very specific niche things of a folk practice and you don't live there, that will be kind of hard to do. Um, but are there some practices that people can do and incorporate into their practice if they don't live in Northern Germany? Yes. Um, of course, you won't be able to do things like um, communicate with land spirits from Northern Germany. Um, but what you can do are like the um, divinatory practices that I talked about with Spötenkickerei. Um, you'll have to like read up on them and how they exactly work. And there are also like some taboos that you have to observe. And of course, areas within Germany will have different ideas of how to specifically conduct these practices. So you'll have to get more specific with that. Mm. Also, you can do like your spells, for example, in uh, Low Saxon or in Frisian. That would and, be really cool. Yeah. And, um, for anyone who's uh, not necessarily sure of what I'm talking about, um, I already said what Low Saxon is. Um, it's also called Platt in German, for example. So these are the same thing. You might also have luck with uh, just Googling Low German. That's also a name for it. Um, this is like a minority language. There's also the Frisian languages. And they will also, of course, have their unique magical terminology. Um, although I'm not familiar with that, Specifically, I'm not Frisian, um, but they uh, live basically uh, west of Flensburg. They are like the North Frisians. And then uh, in northwestern Germany, near the coast, ex uh, directly east of the Netherlands, there are the East Frisians. And then south of them a bit are the Zata Frisians. The interesting thing there is that the uh, Sata Frisians speak Frisian, but the East Frisians don't. They instead speak Low Saxon, oh. um, because uh, basically it was that Low Saxon was this big trading language, and so the East Frisians just adapted speaking Low Saxon for convenience, mm. uh, although their specific dialect still has some original Frisian words in it. So that's also an interesting thing between like ethnicity doesn't always equal language um yeah uh, so you can look up what minority language and what specific dialect of that minority language your ancestors would have spoken and try to learn bits and pieces of it as much as you can and either find spells already written in that language or create your own spells and this will give you like a sort of boost i feel like when i do my workings in Low Saxon, I feel like I'm like so much more immersed with my ancestors from here specifically. Mm -hmm. And your of course your ancestors will, will always respond more when you talk to them in their native language. So if you do spell work with that, they'll probably give you some bigger boost or some response. And yeah, I think these are some things that you can do no matter where you are in the world. And by the way, before before I end my big tangent, I'll also say that uh, your family probably wasn't the only family migrating to the area that you now live. And there was probably a big migration wave. So there is probably a diaspora community of Germans that got to where you are exactly at the same time. And most likely they'll also have had folk magical practices that they most likely will also have um, still observed in the new area and adapted for the new area. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky, if you're lucky, there are still or were people in the past that already did a bit of the legwork of adapting North German folk magic for this new area. So you can just look for that, for example, and see if there's anything that you could maybe use in your practice. That's a that's a very good tip, actually. Um, I also really love the um, the advice about the languages because I totally agree with that. I mean, I don't, I didn't necessarily 
really grow up speaking Low Saxon. So I know some terms and I know that like my grandparents uh, were able to speak it, but like we weren't really ta taught how to do that, which I kind of feel like is very sad. I really want to learn it. Um, but I started out as I feel like a lot of people doing all of my work in English because all of the sources were in English. And when I started out, I kind of felt like doing it in German kind of sounded cringe. <laughs> so I did everything in English. Um, and only like a few years back, I started uh, switching to German. And that feels so different. I can't really explain it, but it feels so different. It feels much more genuine. And I totally agree. I feel especially if I'm incorporating my ancestors in anything, it's much more efficient. <laughs> and yeah, it just it just feels better. Yeah. I feel like if you're um, using your second language in anything, it will always be like um, a bit more distant to you uh, when because your mother tongue is like it's so personal. And if you use a second language, it's very like, I don't know, the emotions don't hit as hard, necessarily. Yeah, definitely. All right, so the last of the more general questions. I'm very excited about that <laughs> because like I am an herb person. I personally, I, I love to get into herb folklore. That has been a huge rabbit hole this entire year. Um, and I just love basically working anything with herbs. Um, so what would you say are some native plants that grow in uh, northern Germany or maybe maybe even specifically in your region uh, that are important to the folk magic? Like, are there specific herbs that are used more often than others? Or is there any like very fascinating folklore about some specific plants? Um, yeah, so I uh, looked up what like the native plants in my area are uh, to kind of get a better feel for it. And basically, all of the plants here can also be found um, natively growing in other areas of Germany or Europe. But what will change is the frequency of um, of which they will pop up. Mm. Um, so one of the most used plants in my practice, I feel like, is stinging nettle. Um, and that's, I feel like, such an all-rounder when it comes to plants. Um, I use it for uh, say, things like um, protection magic mainly, but it can also be used in healing magic and if you're very crafty, you can also make like a fabric out of it uh, oh, yeah. by like, yeah, by spinning um, some of the nettle fibers. And that also has a big folkloric um, uh, attestation to it that like clothes made from nettle fibers are like especially protective and give you kind of sort of, sort of superpowers. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like you can use nettle in so many diverse circumstances mm. that it has been really like become a staple in my practice and i think lots of cultures basically everywhere nettle pops up there will be similar associations with it so um i don't know if you knew you know her but i think some people watching might know her uh velasta is a um indigenous practitioner. She is from the uh, Republic of Mordovia in oh, yeah. Russia. Mm -hmm. And she um, combines like Slavic and finno ugric practices. Mm -hmm. And nettle is also very big in her um, practice and in her culture, mm -hmm. even though that's like way more East than where I am. And I feel like I've heard uh, similar stuff about nettle being used in uh, the UK, which is like way westward from where I am. So um, even though it's also native here, stinging nettle has this like overarching importance. Yeah. Um, other than that, I would recommend every, everyone to just um, look for the plants that are more commonly found in northern Germany, like for example, um, oak trees, um, beech trees. I love uh, oak trees. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> uh, birch trees also are very big. Uh, yes. That's actually something that um, 
was used in my family, uh, birch trees, because um, I know that in like Scandinavia, like Sweden, birch sap is often used to drink as like an invigorating thing in spring. Mm. Uh, there is this YouTuber called Jonna Jinton, uh, and she always films herself uh, tapping birch sap. Mm -hmm. My family also tapped birch sap, but from what I could gather, we didn't use it to drink, we used it to wash our hair. Um, huh. I don't know what the benefits of that would be necessarily, but this is what has been passed on to me. So you haven't um, tried it? No, we don't have any birches on our property that we could legally tap, which yeah. means that my ancestors did it illegally. But <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, the laws didn't exist back then. <laughs> exactly. It was war times. Nobody really cared and stuff it, like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just tap that birch. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this is also like, of course, uh, in the middlelands where I live, birches and oaks are the most prevalent trees, so they will also be the most prevalent plants in folk magic, obviously. Um, we also have, like, um, not that Germany is flat, but my region kind of has mountain, mountains, like hills, basically. <laughs> mountains and, for northern Germany, mountains. <laughs> yeah. And these are like the northernmost points of the Teutoburg forest, and also the uh, Wiengebirge, I don't know what it's called in English, the Wien Mountains. Uh, and on that area, there are a lot of... Um, I forgot what this fucking tree is called. Uh, Just imagine it's... Scots Pine, it says. Oh, Scots Pine. Oh, yes, I've heard that. <laughs> uh, so we also have a lot of those on our mountains. And this is, of course, something where they will also show up in folk magic. I think you can use the like needles from that in tea. Mm. And that sounds delicious. Yeah, I've never tried that either, but I should really get around to it. Um, <laughs> other than that, just like raspberries also kind of have a, a similar associations to um, like nettle because they also have like these stinging thingies. And yeah, these are just like a rough roundup of plants native to northern Germany that mm. are frequently used in folk magic, but honestly anyone curious about that i would really suggest you look up plants which are commonly found here yourself and then go and look at their like witchy associations yeah yeah also some something that i mean of course if you don't speak german that that will be hard but like i have gotten so many just in general like like healing plant books on uh, on flea markets for like a euro or something which had a lot of like folk associations folk magical um apply uh, appliances for the the herbs and stuff uh so now i can like i have like 10 15 books on that and i i just look every plant up and see what pops up in which book because every book will have something else um so that's that's maybe also something that people can do um by the way i i feel like one all-rounder that is kind of kind of like stinging nettle a little bit is dandelion mm, yeah because like oh i mean so it grows basically everywhere and i mean st still nowadays we have this thing where like uh once it goes white and you can blow off the the seeds and then you can make a wish or something i mean if that isn't folk magic i don't know yeah also the roots of that can be used and great tea uh, yeah I've also heard of people making tinctures of, um, from the roots to, uh, I feel like, help with some kind of skin problem. So, mm. yeah, again, an all-rounder. Yeah. Oh, I just, I, I love herbs so much. Oh, I once was able to go to like a, a workshop at uh, Hedeby, which for anyone who doesn't know, that was a very important Viking trading point um, in like, at by, by Schleswig, which is a little bit of south where I'm from, a little bit north from where I'm living now. So basically in the middle. Um, and I went to a workshop there where there was this, this lady talking about um, plants that were used actually in the Viking Age, which was fascinating and gave me so many insights. But also you can see if you're looking at plant folklore now that it's actually still kind of similar. Only that some of the plants don't really grow natively around there anymore. For example, of course, like Angelica was a big one, but at least I don't know where that would still grow natively in my area. I have no clue. Um, 
that's the thing. Some plants will have like become endangered or died out. Um, that's something that I've noticed in my practice when we have like folkloric uh, records of um, specific herbs being gathered at, for example, the Thursday before the assumption of Thursday before the assumption of Mary. Um, some of the plants which were traditionally gathered don't really pop up that often here anymore. And if they do, you should leave them alone. Yeah. Uh, so I had to substitute some herbs which worked right in my experience. So you do have to be um, mindful of that. And also, I know that workshop that you mentioned because I wanted to go to it, but I couldn't because at university. <laughs> I saw that being advertised on like the um, Instagram page of Hedeby. And I was like, oh, this is like so up my alley, but I can't go. It would have been so funny if we had just randomly met there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just imagine. <laughs> yeah. I, I bet they will do it again. Yeah, hopefully. It would be cool. Then then we will go together that time. Good. <laughs> All right. So, so that is where we go into more of the personal questions. Uh, I mean, up until now, yes, we have talked a little bit about your personal practice, but most has been more or less like definition things and stuff. Um, so, of course, like the very basic thing. How did you even start out with that? Like, when when did you wake up in the morning and were like, ah, I kind of want to reconnect with, with the folk practices of my area? Um, well, that has been kind of uh, an interesting journey because I grew up with uh, these like uh, pieces of folklore being passed down to me through my family. Um, but I didn't really pay any mind to it. I, I didn't think of it as magical, just like my ancestors did for centuries. But then I think I actually have it written down in my diary, the, the exact date when it was. It was, I feel like, sometime in September or August of 2018, where I stumbled on a video on YouTube by Harmony Nice. And she was uh, like this big Wiccan influencer back then. I don't think she makes videos anymore, but back then, if you were searching for anything witchcraft related, she would pop up and I was like, hmm, this sounds interesting. And then I binged watched every video on her channel and then I discovered other witchy content creators and I was like, this sounds really, really interesting. And then I got to like um, start out in my own practice. Um, I never really considered myself a Wiccan because I, I didn't vibe with that, but I still used like Wic Wiccan inspirations in my practice, for example, about how I structured my altar. Mm. And then over time, I found more content creators and I kind of switched different paths um, and tried out uh, different things. And in my grimoires, I also wrote down the um, tendencies of what each path is like mostly focusing on. And I did that for things such as um, folk magic, of course, but also like uh, traditional like Christian sorcery and ceremonial magic and demonology and crystal magic and new age and everything. And then I wasn't really sure about what I wanted to do with my practice. And I heard the term trad traditional witchcraft being thrown around a lot and I was like hmm, this sounds interesting but I don't know if that's something for me uh, I don't feel like sifting through like records of the witch trials and stuff and then I discovered folk magic and previously I had already heard about Germanic paganism and I thought that was going to be my path because that already had this land connectedness aspect but what bothered me personally was that it was sort of distant to me and so much that had to be reconstructed and especially with West Germanic paganism on the continent there's not that much that's known mm -hmm. and then I kind of combined these two things and figured out that folk magic was a thing and the person that actually set me onto that path was um, chaotic witch aunt uh, Frankie because oh. when Frankie started talking about their path with Italian American folk magic I firstly became aware of the concept of mm. folk magic and how that works and I was like wait that reminds me of something kind of from <laughs> when I was growing up so I started to do more research into that and suddenly I found myself like fully immersed in the folk magic of my area and I felt this new love for researching local folklore and 
uh, researching cultural traditions. And this is also the reason for why I study the things at university that I do. I study archaeology and social anthropology because it is exactly in this area of my interest. So mm -hmm. this kind of snowballed into not just like me in my spiritual path, but also in what I do online and the content that I make and what academic career I pursued. So I guess thank you, Chaotic Witch and, and Harmony Nice. <laughs> and thank you to my grandparents for teaching me folk magic. But that is so interesting because like that is exactly the road I was going down and I'm going down right now. Like literally from like starting out with Harmony Nice and Wicca stuff to like, oh, well, like Germanic or like for me, like Scandinavian uh, pre-Christian stuff is ki is kind of cool. And then kind of realize realizing, yeah, that is cool, but it's very far removed. And there's it's a lot of work that goes into reconstructing that kind of stuff. So maybe the folk magic will be easier to connect to. It's so funny because that's literally the, the exact same road I am going down right now with folk magic. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's the experience for a lot of people. Now that you're like very deep into it, I mean, how deep can a rabbit hole go if you're like starting to do content on that topic and like starting to study it at university and everything? What would you say is your favorite aspect of it? Well, I think it's probably the um, land connectedness and the at homeness that I feel in my practice now. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't know if you know this, uh, I've talked about this uh, a bit on social media. My family actually has a very recent history of expulsion and losing their homes in Silesia. Mm. And the one thing that was like passed down was this like, you need to find a home. Uh, you need to be like firmly planted somewhere with roots. Uh, and my ancestors also experienced a lot of um, discrimination in the past because they, they had this history of being uprooted and being not really from here. Mm -hmm. And having this practice that firmly roots me here is a very, uh, like, relieving in a way. And um, it, it, it just feels good. I feel like I've accidentally healed some sort of ancestral trauma. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And uh, uh, that... It just like is such a like it's such, so me I feel like because it's exactly in the intersection of all of my different interests like everything in my life suddenly clicked into place with like my creativity for example I like to paint draw sketch stuff that I that then transferred into me working in my grimoire and making that kind of like artsy and combining that with my practice. And I was always a very like archaeology minded child growing up. Like I wanted to dig up so much stuff, uh, even my ancestors at one point on the graveyard, but that's a different story. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> and I was fascinated with ancient Egypt as a child. And this then got combined with my um, interests in Germanic paganism. So I studied archaeology. Uh, with a focus on Central Europe, where my area of interest is in. Mm. And with that, I feel like my entire personality suddenly makes sense. And I'm suddenly finally doing the stuff that I need to be doing in a way. And that's, I think, the most rewarding aspect of my practice. I love that answer so much because one, I relate to it so much like th this point where all of a sudden you love doing homework yeah <laughs> that's kind of what it feels like um but also because so many people if you ask them about their favorite aspect of their craft it's some kind of like oh yeah i like doing candle spells or like i like doing this i like doing that so i don't know i i really loved your answer and it, i feel like that's something that a lot of people can relate to who get into the folk practices of their ancestors yeah, yeah. I think that's very common with us generally, and almost. Um, I don't know if if I say trend, that's kind of like not very like that's kind of playing it down and almost coming off as derivative. But I feel like more and more people are coming to this specific angle of approaching their practice. 
Yeah. And even just five years ago, you wouldn't have seen this amount of folk magic practitioners or people working with their ancestors. And I feel like this is kind of a collective experience that all of us are having. Yeah, definitely. And I, I love seeing that because it also makes things so much more diverse. Mm. Because previously, of course, I don't know when when I got into uh, into magic. Wicca was basically the only thing that was out there, especially if you were looking at books in German. Uh, that was especially hard. Everything was Wiccan, um, so of course a lot of practitioners did all of the same things, which is of course also kind of cool because you have common things that you can talk about. But seeing how diverse everyone's practices are getting and everyone's digging into something different, I feel like that is so cool. So, something that I feel like at this point is very uh, is very important um, to say is that what I really dislike is when people, for example, from the US or from Canada, I feel like that's the most common thing, want to reconnect with the folk practices of their ancestors and people start telling them they can't do that because they, they're they not allowed because they're Americans. I won't start to rant. But I hate that. <laughs> so at this point, I know it's I, I know it's not in the questions. But what is your point on that with Northern German folk magic? If if there's like someone from the U.S. who knows their family is from here, um, is it okay if if people get into this practice? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, if you go for North German folk magic specifically, um, of course you will have some struggles of not being in Northern Germany and some spirits are just not going to be available to you. Yeah. Um, and then I would always ask them this question. Why are you getting in into North German folk magic but not into North German American folk magic? Because you will have a much easier time working with the folk magic of the land that you're already living on and if your community for example is close by if you are that fortunate if your diaspora community is close by you'll already have people right there uh, that you can access that you have um, as a resource and this is going to be much um, more pleasant for you in connecting than just trying to reconnect with the folk magic of a people who live on a completely different continent. And of course, you can still research things like North German folk magic. And I feel like that would be also a very rewarding experience because you can draw these connections. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, I would always recommend to look for the diasporic folk magic of your community first before you attempt to like pull something from a different continent to where you're living now that definitely makes a lot of sense and i i totally agree with that it will probably also make research just a lot easier yeah <laughs> because you don't have to learn german or low saxon or anything like that all right perfect a little bit of a of a tangent there um so let's get into something maybe a little bit easier than that, because I know that topic is always a little bit complicated. Um, <laughs> and people have very, very like differing opinions on that. Um, so for your own practice, what would you say are your most essential tools? Mm, I would say, of course, herbs. Uh, and besides that, I don't know if I can count my entire ancestral altar as a tool, but I'm just going to do it for the sake of this video. I let it slide. Um, and uh, this is basically the thing that my entire practice centers around. And there are, of course, many things on that altar that are like their individual tools. For example, I have, wait, the altar is right there. Let me just grab it. <laughs> this might weird some people out, but Köln um, actually <laughs> is a. Um, uh, in, in English, it's basically just called Cologne 4711, I think, or 1,700. Well, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's this um, Cologne that was made in the city of Cologne. That's why Cologne is named that way. Um, and this was the first um, Cologne that was 
accessible to the lower classes of Germany and thus it has a very wide range use and it also found its way into folk magic in many ways. Um, for example, it is used to uh, get rid of like malevolent spirits, for example. And I can't show you a source for that exactly, at least not a written source, but uh, it's basically just a thing that goes around with the zeitgeist around this, at least in my area. Uh, and I've also had similar things from practitioners from the Netherlands. Um, and if you're uh, an American, I would say that the thing that I could compare this to is like Florida water. So basically anything to like um, spruce your spells up a bit to um, uh, also give as an offering to your ancestors, especially if your ancestors used this as mine did. Um, this is also going to be important for that, and I also use it, again, to deter any malevolent entities. Um, so this, um, for similar reasons, although, now, although not as positively smelling, is holy water. Yeah. In my um, local chapel, there is this, like, uh, holy water dispenser, kind of. It's basically just a small barrel that you can like open up at the side and then get a bit of holy water out and I put some in a, um, a glass flask and I use that to anoint myself because of course Christianity is still some sort of aspect in my folk magic. Um, I use it in very unchristian ways, uh, granted. Um, for example, I um, use it as things such as uh, making protective sigils on uh, mirrors and windows and doors and also putting a few drops into floor wash and stuff to mm -hmm. kind of cleanse everything. Uh, and other than that, my rosary, I would say, this is like uh, some, by the way, if you're listening to this and even if Christianity isn't an aspect of your magic, I would still recommend getting a rosary or something like that. You can actually make these prayer beads yourself, especially if you're easily distracted these things are really good for you because you have something to fiddle with during your prayers. Um, and yeah, other than that, I would say like basically just candles. Um, turns out that my ancestors actually prefer me giving them just tea light candles instead of more elaborate ones, which I mean, <laughs> nice. it's, yeah, it's nice. I mean, I don't have to spend as much money. Um, so that's very cost efficient. Thank you, ancestors. Uh, <laughs> Love that. And that's so German, just, also. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, besides that, um, just my divination tools. Like I have Kipper Karten, I have Normand cards, I have tarot, I have runes, and yeah, I think this is just like the gist of what I'm using. I love that. There were a lot of things in it already that I like don't use <laughs> like I would I I mean I struggle still a little bit with like of course if you get into Scandinavian folk magic there will also be Christian aspects um, it's very interesting because it's so mixed you will have even sometimes um, troll formulas so like spells basically that are both calling on for example Thor and then like Jesus or something so they, ju they just mix it I love that so much um, but I personally have not gone so far as to, for example, get some holy water. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I really like that. And yes, definitely um, rosaries or in, in general prayer beads are so great, especially because I feel like nowadays there are so many people that struggle with ADHD, for example, that struggle with meditation for that aspect, for example. That will help you so much. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right, from tools. We're going that back to spirits. I know we already talked about a little bit about what kinds of uh, land spirits exist in your area and things like that. Um, are there specific things that you like to do to connect to them? Um, yes, so I um, work mainly when it comes to spirits with my ancestors and I do a very quick prayer to them every night before I go to bed. And that basically just entails me uh, standing in front of the altar and thanking them for basically looking over me and protecting me. And that's 
it basically it can take less than a minute so it's a very doable thing even if i don't have the energy um if i do more elaborate things and i call upon my ancestors to aid me in spell work i'll usually give them a some sort some sort of offering like the cologne that i just showed you i'll just put a few drops of that on like a tissue that my um great grandmother's sister used to own um, <laughs> and then i kind of fan that tissue a bit above, above my altar so that the scent spreads uh, that's an offering um, i also offer things such as tea or if available some pieces of cake especially uh Stresekucha, which is like a silesian dish a typically silesian dish yeah. that my family makes um in german it's called uh Streuselkuchen, I, oh, I love that. It's so delicious. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of my favorite foods. Um, Understandable. <laughs> yeah, I, um, of course, uh, through that I specifically call upon my Silesian ancestors. Um, other than that, just lighting a candle to connect to them and some prayers. Um, candles generally are like a staple when connecting to spirits. I use also a, um, I have a designated candle for Mary that I always light and then perhaps pray the rosary. And if I want to petition her with something, I put the petition on a piece of paper and fold it and put it under the candle. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to more generally ancestral spirits, I also visit uh, the graveyard because I'm so lucky that I live in the village where some of my ancestors are buried. So I already have a connection to the graveyard here. I and love that. I actually have uh, a semi-recent video of mine, uh, which is a my first vlog that I also made in Low Saxon, where I show how I go to the graveyard and how I connect with my ancestors there. So, anyone interested? You can I love go that and watch one. That. Recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It also has English subtitles, so you'll understand me. Um, and besides that, um, that's just to like show my face to my ancestors and generally the spirits um the forest that i go through to reach that graveyard is also um home of land spirits that i sometimes work with and this is going to be another quick tangent but the land spirits in that forest particularly ha have helped me out on multiple occasions and i um for example lost my purse i think it's called purse like the thing that you put your money into yeah um, <laughs> I lost that in that forest without realizing it, and it laid there for about three days in the forest. And this is like the forest that people go on walks through with their dogs, and it rained in between when it was in the forest. And oh, no. I suddenly realized that I had lost that purse. And as a last-ditch effort to go looking for it, I retraced my steps and ended up back in that forest. And I prayed to the land spirits that please. If you can help me, give me back my purse, then I open my eyes and look to the ground, and there it was. So, uh, sudden, so desperate prayer also works as a form of connection building. <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, in not as dire situations, I do just go through that forest and kind of talk to the spirits a bit. And yeah, besides that, when it comes to deities, I don't. Um, necessarily connect to them that often usually when i do i do it through prayer and mm -hmm. also these only take like a couple of minutes max i am not very a fan of big elaborate um prayer sessions i don't have the time energy or attention span for that <laughs> uh so yeah i don't know how other people do it but i just do my quick prayer and please guys can you help me <laughs> and that's basically it <laughs> so there are not any like specific north german folk which ways which are unique to northern germany in which i connect to spirits i kind of i kind of get that though um especially the it's it's so funny because of course i, I feel like probably my most viewed video on youtube is about deity work mm. And the funny thing is, the more I get into folk magic, the less I do, like, proper in-depth deity work. 
<laughs> I kind of feel like that's a thing that happens to a, a lot of people. That yeah. all, all of a sudden it's like your ancestors and local spirits, and of course local spirits and in general nature spirits, plant spirits were there for for me in my practice previously, also alongside deities. But it kind of like it, it's like previously I have done this much deity work and this much ancestor work, and it's kind of shifted. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I kind of feel the same way with like. Um, prayers to deities where it's like it's a it's a quick little thing maybe but not like this whole elaborate huge thing <laughs> yeah the thing too is that um i feel like especially on social media there's this feeling that your deities can be your friends and mm -hmm. i don't agree with that in my practice i view deities as kind of forces of nature um especially when you look at the folklore of like beings like devil de jäger uh which are in my area uh, he is not necessarily described as someone that you can just connect to easily. He is more mm -hmm. of something that you need to be aware of and stay out of the way of. So these deities to me, both in a Germanic paganism sense and in a folk magic sense, are not as tangible uh, as land spirits or ancestors. Yeah, which of course also makes sense. I mean, like land spirits and your ancestors and stuff, especially if you're so lucky as you are to like live very close to a cemetery or graveyard where actually your ancestors were buried, which mm -hmm. I'm not that lucky, sadly. But like if you are, I mean, then like your ancestors and the local spirits and the nature spirits are like right around the corner, like just stumble out the door and there they are. Um, whereas deities, they are, of course, I kind of always feel like you have to first, you have to kind of call them in. Whereas like local spirits and, and other kinds of uh, ancestors and stuff, you don't really have to call in there, there all the time. Um, yeah. So it's more I'll, immediate. I'll say though, um, that especially in folklore, a lot of land spirits uh, don't like to be acknowledged directly. So you kind of give them offerings more like without really looking at them or without uh, necessarily saying, this is an offering for you, my faithful man spirit. <laughs> uh, you kind of just put it out there. Yeah. And just don't pay any attention to it. And you'll also have to make sure to like uh, not speak ill of the land spirits in any way, uh, because there is a lot of folklore of things of that nature going terribly wrong. Like in the best case scenario, they will just straight up leave you. Mm -hmm. In the worst case scenario, they will like curse your cow and burn down your house oh yeah <laughs> i always i i always uh really like to look at also the folklore around house spirits when it comes to that kind of stuff because i feel like it's kind of similar of course i don't i don't know how it is in your area but like the house spirits um or the folklore around house spirits in my area is still very scandinavian um they're also called nisse or nis puk um so it's it's basically it's basically just straight up Danish, um, <laughs> um, and if you look at those, they behave kind of similarly. They don't want they don't want you to try to look for them. They don't want to be seen, and if you see them, that's generally not really a good thing. Or they they will try to hide themselves from you, um, but they still want their offerings. And if you don't give them their offerings, they will get mad. <laughs> yeah. So, the uh, house spirits in my area are either called. Heinze mention, but I think that's just because of the famous story from Cologne that that name just transferred here. Mm -hmm. uh, a more native name for them would be Skönauten. I don't know what that necessarily means. That's an uh, interesting word. Yeah, I, even though I speak Low Saxon and that's a Low Saxon word, it basically just means nothing, really, at least not that I know of. So, yeah, maybe that's some vestige of something older that made sense back in the past but <laughs> is lost in translation nowadays but that's interesting because i have also never heard that word and it kind yeah. of sounds a little bit weird i don't know yeah it's again very regional and this is what i mean when i say that each region kind of has their own thing going on like you yeah. wouldn't know skunauken and i like didn't know about nisse for example yeah i love that though ah regional differences ah i, I could talk about that for ages <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have actually already gotten to the last question. 
which of course now that I'm looking at we're we've already been talking for nearly two hours so I am so sorry <laughs> um <laughs> I, I hope you didn't have any other plans this evening no I mean I love having these long ass conversations with other practitioners because I don't often get to talk face to face with them this way so I'll I usually use the opportunity very well oh that's perfect I I always just hope that the per that, that the person I'm interviewing isn't like uh let's do half an hour and leave because I will go on tangents and I I'm here to talk for hours. I think the last interview that I that I did was also two hours or something. So <laughs> but okay, the last question. I I'm very interested in this because uh of course we all know like this like let's just say general, more modern witchcraft and all of the practices embedded in that. Do you know if there are any similarities between northern german folk magic and more like modern well-known practices or maybe even practices that stem from here um yes question mark um <laughs> the thing is uh in my area there used to be a man in the 16th century called johann wir and if you look him up on wikipedia it's like this long of a page and it's it reads like a fantasy novel basically <laughs> uh, and he was a a student of a famous like uh, witch practitioner uh, of of a um, ceremonial practitioner who was accused of being a witch uh, and he was called Agrippa and he lived I think in Mettesheim or Cologne I'm not sure mm. and Johann Wier was a student of him, and later Johann uh, went on to be a very strong opponent of the witch hunts. And mm. then he got together with a countess from my region, and the story of that countess, uh, she's called Anna, is also very fascinating, um, because she ruled her realm on her own, because her husband, which was unfaithful to her and tried to lock her up in a tower, died of syphilis, so she... <laughs> He deserved uh, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so she was basically the sole ruler and she was very interested in herbal healing. And then she and Johann Wier got together and became best friends, basically. And Johann Wier was a physician, among other things. And they both made it so that in this area, there were no witch hunts. Mm. So uh, they kind of... Um, protected witches, so to say, and also elevated, elevated the art of herbal healing. And in that same area, uh, in that same time frame, Johann Wier wrote a book which has a weird as Latin name, something like De Prestiges de Demonium or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that book is basically not just a um, basically lots of arguments against witch hunts generally, but it also has a list of supposed demons and how their hierarchy is structured in hell. And then this book became the basis of the Lesser Key of Solomon in the Goetia, which is basically the foundational text of Western esotericism. I think I've heard of that book. That's so cool. Yeah, so... If there are any um, like ceremonial practitioners listening, you can thank the guy from my region for that. So <laughs> I was very surprised when I heard about the story. And there's even a um, tower made that was made in his honor in the capital of my region. And he and uh, Countess Anna are like very like, big historical figures from here. And I feel like because of that, this region is also very rich in witch folklore and witch practices mm -hmm. and it's also a very touristy area in that way where you can buy witch bumper stickers uh, <laughs> and which um, witches are basically plastered on the walls of uh, every house and there are uh, special like walking paths which are like um, have signs with witches on them and each sign represents some sort of a very folkloric folklorically significant part of that area so yeah i love that 
witches and this area are like this. <laughs> I, th I thought that was only a thing with the hearts region. <laughs> yeah, it surprised me too. I mean, we're not as big as the hearts with mm. that, but uh, we still sometimes have these small pockets of witch folklore. I, I in general love though to learn about like all of all of the like early magicians in Germany because I, I feel like Germany was so important back then mm. uh, that even it was so important that that even manifested in Scandinavian folk magic, where a a kind of folklore, um, kind of what was developed, it was developed, but it developed on itself. I don't know how to say it properly. Um, where people would say that uh, magicians and witches and stuff and practitioners would learn in Germany in Wittenberg at the university and get their black books there and mm -hmm. stuff. So I I was so I, when I read that I was like. That's weirdly specific. Like, what? Yeah. It's exactly Wittenberg University, and I'm like, why though? <laughs> yeah, we have a very witchy country, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, also a lot of history with the witch hunts, but well, <laughs> things go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. All right, that was the last of the questions that I got from my viewers for you. But I also uh, always like to close my interviews because I know that question always gets asked and I, I love that people want to learn more, is the question of sources. If someone would want to get into Northern German folk magic, which sources would you recommend to them? Well, um, if you do not speak German or Low Saxon, I have some very bad news for you that <laughs> Um, basically, I am the only source for you. I'm sorry. Oh no, what a shame! You're stuck with me. At <laughs> least the only source that only source that I know of. Um, of course, you can watch all of my free content online, and also if you want, to subscribe to my Patreon, where I have very long and in-depth blog posts about this topic. Um, also, fully sourced, by the way. Um, and other than that, I think if you know a bit of German or if you um, are fine with like using the auto translate button, um, even though that can be a slippery slope sometimes, there are also other creators for North German folk magic. Um, for example, on Instagram, there is uh, this account called Following the Court. And this is a person coming from Northeastern Germany, and they focus on like practices from. Um, the Mecklenburg area, the northern parts of Brandenburg, and also either the practices of Pomerania or Prussia, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the parts which used to belong to Germany are, but are now in Poland. Mm -hmm. But again, their content is in German, so you would have to use the auto-translate. Um, also, uh, there is this creator called uh, Naomi Mikrida, which I also interviewed on my channel. and. She's from the Netherlands, but she draws her practice both from the northeastern Netherlands and northwestern Germany. And what's interesting is that her ancestors basically came from exactly the region where I'm from, like a couple of villages away. That's so, so cool. <laughs> we share a lot of things in our practice. And uh, if you're uh, like, she also makes her content available in English. So you could maybe gather some information from her and her content. Mm. Other than that, I would just say that you would have to learn German or even more specifically Low Saxon or even more specifically a specific regional dialect of Low Saxon. Good luck because, with that. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of the sources will just be in these regional terminologies. Yeah. Um, and with that, I would recommend looking for um, either books on the folklore of a specific region um, there was like uh, this book series from the German Regionala Verlag, I believe, that um, collected a bunch of folklore from different areas in Germany. And I believe Northern Germany is also uh, present in that series. But other than that, you will also find more books on regional German folklore. Um, and you might also want to search for more academic anthropological articles on the folk culture of different areas in northern Germany. And you might also be able to find them in English. 
because English is a very prevalent language used in academics. Um, and you can look for these articles on sites like uh, JSTOR and also academia.edu. Mm. And they are they're mostly free to download. Um, if you are with a university or some sort of institution, you'll have a much easier time finding these sources. Yeah. And yeah, also, I would recommend learning how to read uh, the Fraktur font, which is like an old German lettering system, which is sometimes really hard to read, especially even if you are German, but especially for people who are not. Um, and what is also sometimes weird there that is that sources can be so old sometimes that they were made before a standardized like uh, writing system, like a spelling system. Mm -hmm. So things can be spelled differently when compared to how German is spelled nowadays. So these are a few caveats to keep in mind when going on your research journey. But yeah, just English sources are very sparse. Sadly, sadly, yeah. <laughs> but at least I feel like in, in German you will find quite a lot of books on the folklore of a pretty specific area. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was when I was looking, I was kind of afraid that I wouldn't find anything. But there were quite a lot of books. I think I have four or five, six books on the topic now. And they can, they can get very, very specific in region. <laughs> All right. Well, with that being said... That was the last question that I had for you for this interview. Thank you so, so much for letting me interview you. This was insanely fun. Oh, I, I love yeah. I love making these videos uh, so much, these interviews. It's always so interesting. And with every single video, I learn something new. I love that so, so much. Um, so again, like if you have maybe any ongoing projects or anything that you want to uh, talk about, anything that you want people to know, um, feel free to plug anything that you want to plug right here. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to reiterate, um, this Bögen kicker on most of my social media. Um, if you have a link tree, you'll find all of it. And currently, I feel like 2024 is going to be the year of collapse for me, especially like early 2024, because I have like uh, Christmas holidays from a university right now, so I have a lot of time. So I ask all of my mutuals basically, do you <laughs> want to collab? So. <laughs> <laughs> early 2024 is going to be filled with me talking to a lot of other people so if you're interested to learn about this and to learn about the practices of different people who are in some way shape or form related to German folk magic you can look forward to that and other than that I would just say if you have a dollar or two to spare to check out my Patreon and see if you like it um, and yeah I think that's all for now definitely Sub subscribe to the patreon do it <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right then thank you so so much again you were a wonderful guest thank you and uh yeah i will let you go on with your evening after actually nearly exactly two hours yeah i'm kind of proud <laughs> bye bye, bye. <laughs> and to my viewers i will see you in the next video <laughs>